Tonight's concert features two romantic giants, Chopin and Mendelssohn. They were contemporaries. They met a few times in Paris, but their music and life could not be more different. Two opposite aspects of romanticism. Chopin's biography is filled with contradictions and paradoxes. A major composer, he wrote no symphonies, no operas, no chamber music, focusing on minor forms and composing almost exclusively for the piano. A legendary performer who revolutionized and modernized piano playing, he had an aversion to public performances. The total number of concerts Chopin played is 30, most of them in living rooms and salons, and in some he was not the only featured artist. There was a practical side to his preference for intimate spaces. From the beginning, he had been slight of frame and frail, and his playing, rather than rely on power, possessed exquisite delicacy and infinite shades of pianos and shimmering pianissimos. As his illness progressed, with his weakening constitution, he could not play 40 altogether. Such a reduced dynamic scale would have been lost at the large hall. Liszt was the thundering, virile virtuoso, the lady killer, the uh, showbiz idol, all the things Chopin was not. To return to our paradoxical portrait, he was an ardent patriot, always traveled with a cup of Polish soil in his luggage, but never returned to his beloved Poland after leaving at age 18 not even to visit his family. He preferred to get together with other aristocratic expatriates and discuss Polish literature and culture in the comfort of Paris and to create his own Poland of the mind more fantastic and more seductive than the real Poland could ever be. He was an elitist, if not a snob, associated only with his drawing room society. And the list of his pupils reads like the social register. Princess so-and-so, Baroness this or that, Madame Rothschild, etc. Yet, his music is nourished by grassroots village folklore, mazurkas, krakowiaks, and ballads inspired by the poetry of Adam Mickiewicz. Publicly aloof, withdrawn and reserved, extremely private and discreet, his music, as we all know, overflows with emotion, revealing his deepest longings and dreams, every nocturne a confession. In spite of his being gentle and considerate, neurotically sensitive, he lacked a generous spirit. His contemporaries, Schumann, Mendelssohn, Balzac, Delacroix, Liszt, all giants, embraced him, hailed his arrival, and acknowledged his greatness. Schumann, in his publication, proclaimed, hats off, gentlemen, a genius, and so did all the others. Chopin's response to this largesse was not a word. He resented potential competition and maintained a detached silence between unkind remarks. Imagine Schumann dedicated a composition to him, Chrysleriana, and Chopin praised the design of the title page a great genius is not necessarily a complete man. His music is all about love, passion, longing. But alas, 
he was not physically or psychologically made for the ecstasies and exertion of physical love. The cup of love that could not be drained in life is brimming in his music. The central romance of his life was with Georges Sand, a celebrity author and early feminist. It lasted almost 10 years, which out of 39 is quite a stretch. No one reads George Sand anymore, but at the time they met, she was more famous than Chopin. In spite of her many lovers, she never experienced sexual fulfillment. Just as Chopin lived in sounds, she lived in words, and her love affairs were merely literary material for her next book. This sublimation, by the way, this uh, ch channeling of erotic fantasies and energies into art is fairly common. The Bronte sisters, Aubrey Beardsley, the great painter, John Keats, a contemporary of Chopin, were all consumptives. D.H. Lawrence, he wrote Lady Chatterley's Lover during the last stages of tuberculosis and sexual starvation as the disease made him impotent. You're about to hear Chopin's great piano sonata with the famous funeral march as its slow movement. We have grown accustomed to dance music with no dancers, hymns with no service, marches without a parade, serenades with no lovers, the romantics with their death obsession have introduced funeral marches with no coffins in the middle of a sonata. Throughout his life, he had a morbid terror of being buried alive, and the last sentence he scribbled on a crumpled piece of paper is, I implore you to have my body opened so that I don't get buried alive. His heart was preserved in cognac and smuggled by his sister Ludovica back to Warsaw. But if you allow me a Chopinesque flourish, Chopin's heart is not pickled in cognac. It is pulsating and throbbing in his music. Had the Mendelssohns lived in our time, the following would have been a double portrait. But alas, we are still in the early 19th century with its misguided repressive notion about the role of women in society and it is its distorted sense of noblesse oblige. All four Mendelssohn children were blessed with abundant talent, but Fanny and Felix were extra, extraordinary. She was born in 1805 and he followed four years later. They received the same musical education from the finest musicians of the day and showed the same prodigious gifts. In 1820, she's now 15, Felix is 10, 11. Her father is writing her a letter from Paris. He's on a business trip. It is a document worth reading about her brother's ambitions. Music will perhaps become his profession. Whilst for you, it can and must only be an ornament, never the root of your being and doing. We may therefore forgive him some ambition and desire to be acknowledged in a pursuit which appears very important to him because he feels a vocation for it, whilst it does you credit that you have always shown yourself good and sensible in these matters. Remain true to these sentiments and to this line of conduct. They are feminine and only what is truly feminine 
is an ornament to your sex. She never played in concert halls, only in private salons, including her own, where her songs and piano music were performed, married a well-known painter, Wilhelm Hensel, and raised a family. Her unpublished manuscripts are beautifully illustrated by her loving husband. She remains very close to Felix and had a role in shaping some of his major works. He encouraged her compositional activities, but discouraged publication. Was it jealousy, fear of competition, protectiveness, or was he reflecting, like his father, the prevailing norms of high society? If her music appears mostly lyrical, dainty, delicate, lacking in bold, aggressive gestures. Think of how and what ladies painted in their drawing rooms. It would have been unladylike to draw battle scenes, hunting, muscular mythological dramas, all had to conform to Papa Mendelssohn's idea of what was properly feminine. The bond between Fanny and Felix was so powerful, so profound, their shared musical genius so binding, it is doubtful if either was able to love their spouses as deeply. Here is a letter she is writing Felix on her wedding day. She is 17. I have your portrait before me and ever repeating your dear name and thinking of you as if you stand at my side. I weep every moment of my life. I shall love you from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure that in doing so, I shall not wrong Hansel, whom she is just about to get married to. Do you, like me, feel that her weeping is the pain of resignation as she surrenders her amazing talent, suppresses her dreams, creative spark, upon submitting to the role of a housefrau. In describing the genius of Felix, certain words keep appearing. Transparent, lucid, elegant, perfect in form, refined, crystalline, Schumann, upon hearing tonight's trio, wrote, Mendelssohn is the Mozart of the 19th century. Even his detractors use the same adjectives implying absence of the tragic, the morbid, and the lack of Sturm und Drang, so frequent in Chopin's music. All of Mendelssohn's music is a passionate hymn, a paean, to the Enlightenment, an expression of his, of his belief in the ennobling power of art. He felt that reason, balance, and beauty could bring about religious tolerance, social harmony, and universal brotherhood. It may sound naive in retrospect, especially these days, but this was Felix's credo. He was also an accomplished violinist, a dazzling pianist, composer, conductor, a gifted painter, and a gymnast. It makes Leonard Bernstein look like an underachiever. These confusing, disturbing days, let's take in Felix's uplifting optimism, the joie de vivre of his scherzo and his message of unwavering hope. Enjoy the concert.